This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Welcome to Teacher Talk Radio, the podcast that brings you inspiring conversations with educators from around the world. I'm your host, James Rabin, and this is The Late Show. In today's episode, we have a very special guest who will shed light on the fascinating world of instructional coaching. Join us... This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. So joining us today is Sat Groshow an experienced American elementary teacher turned school leader. He has a PhD in instructional design and hosts the Progressively Incorrect podcast. With a passion for instructional coaching, Sack is based in Seattle and is an instructional coach. He's helped educators unlock their full potential and create an impactful learning experience for her, their students. Now, in this episode, we're going to explore the role of instructional coaching in education, its benefits, its practical strategies that teacher can implement in their classrooms. Whether you're an educator looking to enhance your teaching practice or someone interested in the field of science, this episode will provide valuable insights and inspiration. So grab a cup of coffee or something stronger if you're over here in England and it's the end of half term and it's lovely and sunny outside tonight. And get ready to start with this engaging conversation as we dive into the world of instructional coaching with SAC. Without further ado, let's jump straight in. Welcome, SAC, finally. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm uh, in near Seattle, Washington right now in the United States. Uh, it is really good weather this time of year. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just ha- I'm happy to be on. It's funny, you're, you're at the end, you said of half terms, so... Uh, and you know to talk about instructional coaching, uh, that that that's I guess that's a good time to talk about it uh, when everyone's kind of you know burnt out and everything. Yeah, thanks for having me on. No a pleasure, a pleasure. Yeah, it's it's a great way um, in England in some ways now to start looking at. It. We've got another seven week term coming up. I know some people in Ireland are actually finishing at the moment, but it gives us a chance to think about next year, next academic year, and getting all of these processes in place and looking at our school development plans as well. Kind of want to dive really into you, your role, where you've got to to start off with. And I don't know this uh, this evening and through this podcast, we're going to explore instructional coaching in uh, two parts. And part one's really going to explore what it is your role on what you've done and what works. And I think part two, we really want to um, pack some of those dogmas of instructional coaching, some of those things that we may kind of not get straight away. We may do our coaches a disservice um, in some ways. And I know you've got some interesting thoughts in there. So, Zach, introduce yourself. What's your journey through education um, to your current role? Well, uh, first, uh, I am an instructional coach, and I know that that means something different depending on what country you're in, what system you're in, uh, even the school level. Uh, we talk about, you know, different types of instructional coaches. Um, maybe, maybe you can answer me this question, which is like, what, for, for you in England, what, what is an instructional coach? And maybe I can like bridge kind of what I do with, with, with that definition or that, you know, that idea of a role. Yeah, so over here in England, we don't really have um, a dedicated role that is an instructional coach in some ways. And often um, my, my sector is more primary and I work across a primary amount of 15 schools. We really are looking at the teaching and learning leads. And so we have some schools that are five, six form entry. So for a primary school, that's massive. We have some that are one form um size school so i think our smallest school is about 120 and our biggest school is about 850 children but what often we have is a the leaders or um of teaching and learning they coach a series of teachers and then sometimes that is then down and they coach others as well so we have that if you are very lucky it's a de- dedicated role as an assistant head or deputy and they take their time to do that through a professional development sequence within schools uh, but we don't often and please 
add into the chat, but I haven't seen many, if any, roles that are dedicated instructional coaches over here. One thing that we do have, um, and I know I'll probably bring it up later, is and we have early career teachers, our ECTs. So within the first two years of your career, you go on this almost instructional coaching plan and you work on with StepLab um, and Ambition, a really progressive instructional coaching idea um, where you go in and get supported by your mentor um, once a week if it's your first year and then in, when you go to your second year it's once every fortnight and I'm a newly ECT mentor as well so seeing it support them in class is a really interesting um, and it's a far cry from what we've had previously as well. Wow well so that all tracks with what I've what I understand too like I follow a lot of people Josh Goodrich, uh, Peps McRae, uh, uh, Tom Sherrington, uh, lots of people that are really into the instructional coaching world over uh, on your side of the pond. Uh, but over here, like you like you suggested, really instructional coaching's become a dedicated role for schools. And in my district, we have a, a ton of schools. I mean, we have five high schools and uh, dozens of middle schools and many, many more primary schools. Uh, each of these buildings has one person who fills the role of instructional coach while all of the teachers uh, who perhaps maybe should be promoted to, to, to a level of like head of year, head of department or whatever, uh, those roles don't exist. So that most teachers are teaching a full timetable and uh, the assistant principals or the, you know, the top, the top, the top leadership are really focused in on behavior uh, dealing with parents, a lot of it is policy and, and really much more bureaucratic stuff than I <laughs> have to deal with. And um, there sort of was this gap in all these schools where who is actually leading uh, the charge for the learning? Who's actually helping the teachers become better uh, beyond, you know, uh, uh, sitting at the staff table or, or you know, after school, uh, you know, meeting with other teachers? Who's actually mentoring them? Who's helping them build their capacity? And so this, that's, that's what I do. I'm in a middle school, uh, which is grades uh, six through eight, which I think for you is year seven through nine. Uh, and uh, I work in a, in a school of 800 or so students, uh, high needs, high, highly disadvantaged population uh, in this area. Uh, you know, some, some, would, some would argue it sort of has a reputation in this area for this, 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 this school, like needing a lot more support. And um, and so that's what I so that's the role I fill. I, and you can imagine many challenges in, in just that in just that role that we will discuss uh, further uh, in this in this podcast. Yeah, fascinating. I think this is one of those conversations where um, hopefully you'll learn a lot from the practices within England, especially with Peps McGree, Tom Shelton, Josh Goodridge. I'd like to throw in John Hutchinson with that as well and what he's been doing um, in ambition the ECT program and I know we're going to learn a lot um, from you in America and what you do as well so um, this divide across the pond will hopefully get smaller and we can learn from each other as we go through what is seen as a real big improvement in um, professional development and the research that's come out of that as well but one of the questions I always ask my guests is uh, what's your purpose what has inspired you to work in education because I think that really gets to the crux of where you are now, that really core values of you, your role, and, and almost how you got there as well. So what's your purpose then, Zach? Well, I mean, I started as a teacher, and I taught in primary school for eight years. And throughout that time, um, I I mean, I, I just always sense there's just something, there's something wrong, there's something off. We're asking teachers, that are brand new to, you know, after putting a lot of money uh, lots of times into their, into their college education, we're asking them to sort of jump into the, the deep end of the swimming pool and just figure out teaching uh, on their own. And I, when I first started, I was teaching third grade, so year four, and uh, I, was, I was given some pretty structured materials, which was, which was great. Uh, and I was given a lot of support from uh, my colleagues that were next door. Uh, but 
I was really missing out on that third piece, which was someone by my side, someone helping to, to build my capacity, someone who kind of stopped. Like we, we, we all know that this pure discovery learning is just bad for students. I, I needed someone to end a period of extended struggle and trial and error problem solving when it came to my, to my classroom. And so like you asked about the purpose, uh, it was actually towards the middle of my first year that the instructional coach at that school finally made their, their way to me. They had been, you know, dipping in and out of all these different classrooms, maybe less systematic than, than what you, <laughs> what you described in terms of, you know, what you've seen. Uh, and they finally made it to me and I was giving this lesson about, you know, that it was a math lesson and the, uh, I was sort of telling a big old story about uh, maybe I was at a market in, in Egypt or something, and I was, I was haggling and trying to use my negotiating skills. And I was telling this really great story, and all the kids were, were really, really hooked on this story. And then I had them go off and sort of solve math problems, and these math problems were only like peripherally related <laughs> to this story I had told. And... And afterwards, I met with this instructional coach, and he, he broke this down for me. And, and honestly, it kind of hurt my feelings. You know, I, I had, <laughs> I'd really, I really tried hard to put that lesson together. And he was basically telling me it made, it made no sense. It was incoherent. Uh, what I was telling didn't lead to what they needed them to do. Uh, and then when, when I was having them do it, the behaviors, uh, in my perspective, they were calm and quiet, but for him, he, he didn't see it that way. He saw it that every single student should be on task, pencils moving, eyes on the problems. And so his expectation of what great teaching looks like and his model of what's good teaching uh, was that of an expert teacher. And mine was as a novice teacher who had so far been doing this discovery learning stuff. Um, you know, working with him, we went through a process of he modeled lessons, he co-taught lessons where he would sort of interject or slide in during, during my lessons. And he would say things that I still say today, like that I didn't even know you could say, like he would look over and say, hey, Tommy, he's on fire. Oh my goodness, Janessa, look at her, how focused she looks. And he'd be, you know, gesturing with, with his arms, sort of almost like you know, uh, madly gesturing and, and he, would, he would fill the room with his presence and confidence. And I would start doing that. And I started to take on that role. And, 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 and after a while, he sort of figured, he figured that I had figured out math well enough that he could move on to other areas of my teaching. So, I mean, my purpose, I think, is to be that person. His name was Pat McGregor, uh, is to be the Pat McGregor uh, of, of any school I'm at, someone who, who arrives uh, at just in time to, to end, <laughs> to end your trial and error and your suffering really, and to give you the tools and to give you the structures that will allow you to be a really great teacher. I think that's so elegantly put. And I think it's really important that you have a real, you really know why you're doing this role and the impact it's had on you. Often it's that, isn't it? You've had a positive impact or it's the opposite. You've had a negative impact of something on your career hence why you know it should be better in some way um and i think it's a real privilege no um i hopefully agree that seeing other teachers and seeing other schools and seeing other classrooms is such a privilege in teaching and it's one way that you can really develop you not only as a coach but as a teacher and see actually what are those common themes one of the things i often say to my teachers and schools and heads that i work with is we overcomplicate. Let's go back to the crux. Why? What are you doing and why? What's the impact? And it's almost that cause and effect element of what you see in uh, kindergarten or early years. And that's what children explore. And you've got to think about what are those opportunities we're doing in that classroom? Because everything we should be doing is for the children um, at the end of the day. So I want to kind of explore this idea of, do you need to be an expert um, in teaching and learning? Because instructional coaching goes beyond that traditional professional development models because it provides, as you said, that personalized support and guidance, fostering growth, effectiveness, that co-teaching, that mentoring, that modeling. And it's that collaboration between what is a skilled instructional coach as an educator and focus on those specific pedagogical strategies and reflective. So what how, do you need to then, going back to my question is, um, to become a coach, do you need to be an expert in how learning happens? And then also on that, 
how do you know what you're looking for when you go in and coach someone? Yeah, well, to, to the to the idea of what learn, you know, how learning happens. I mean, what we mean, I think you mean by that would be sort of, do you have a what Dan Willingham called like the mental model of the learner? Like, do you do you understand sort of the cognitive architecture of 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 the learner and how that interacts with uh, you know the environment with 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 tasks that you give students? I mean. Uh, we've learned so much, I think, it, and a lot of it comes down to what England, I think, has taken, uh, has taken this torch and really run with it through, through things like Research Ed and a lot of the great books coming out of like John Cat that I read all the time. Um, but the, the idea that like working memory, for example, is extremely limited, that, uh, that you can override the limitations of working memory. Uh, if you have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge in long-term memory, do you understand retrieval, right? Like if, if instead of starting a lesson by re-exposing the, the students to something they should be able to recall, that you start by having them recall it or retrieve it. Uh, do you, do you, you know, do you, do you understand the negative effects of multitasking, of, of having divided attention? Uh, you know, so if I'm, if I'm teaching and I'm telling some instructions and the students are supposed to be writing at the same time, do, you know, can I recognize that, that there's going to be an interference? Uh, you know, the list, the list goes on and on. It's sort of one of those things where the more I read and the more I develop my expertise around what cognitive science, how that can inform the classroom, the more I see things in other people's classrooms that give me, uh, you know, perfect, uh, you know, ammunition or, you know, fodder to, 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 to you know, to discuss with them. Um, I, I, I just think it, you have to have that mental model of learning. You have to understand how learning happens to be able to recognize problems in classrooms because instructional coaching is a problem solving job. And, you know, you, you, of course you need to be motivated. You need to have characteristics of, you know, being a leader, being a good person, being someone who can build relationships with people. I think that's kind of emphasized maybe too much in some of the literature where really you also need to have knowledge. You need to come into a classroom and just have seen so many classrooms and so many situations, but also understand how individuals uh, tend to process information and how teaching techniques, uh, you know, what, what is the why behind some of these teaching techniques, not just the what. Uh, because without all of this, you end up being an instructional coach who, who really doesn't know what to tell teachers, what to what to what to say to them after their lessons you, you can sense that something is wrong but you don't really have uh an explanation or you don't really have anything to dive into with them so i think i i i'm just i'm just so impressed with how organizations like research ed and, and, and different different uh, uh school leaders uh, in the uk have sort of taken the charge and led this area around cognitive science i think it's absolutely essential yeah and it goes back to um, what are those the research is all about? What are those best bets, isn't it? And as you say, you have a feeling you go into a classroom, and you kind of know, like, oh, there's lots of different things here, but it's working out. What do you need to work on? How can I work with that teacher? And some teachers really love you uh, modelling and collaborating with them, and some of those teachers are like really reluctant as well. So, what are then? some of those key qualities those interpersonal skills for you as a coach that you think are necessary um, to ensure that relationship you have with your coachee is amicable but also professional but in a way that you can be like that Pat McCree and inspire you in your career as well right I mean it's 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 tough for me to answer that because I I, I personally don't really struggle with the relationship side of, of, of you know, working with teachers. Um, I, I don't tend to have that many, you know, that any interpersonal sort of issues with teachers I work with. So it's like, how do I break down what I do and what I've seen from other coaches into like really granular, you know, units or what, what are those leadership traits? I just, I just think if you ask yourself to, you can imagine this person, like who, who, who is this person that you'd really want to go to for support? It's someone that uh, is extremely credible. Like you, they've taught the subject that you've taught for, for quite some time, or they've taught things similar to it. And they're, they're able to show you their knowledge. Uh, they, they're, they're just, they just love teaching and, and, and teaching research. They're able to 
you know, they have a library full of things they can they can they can bring to to any discussion. And there there's somebody that also understands what it means to be a teacher. Uh, when you ask teachers here, uh, you know, why did it why did someone become an instructional coach? You'll get answers like they did it because they couldn't hack it in the classroom. Uh, they didn't they, they didn't have the behavior management skills and they just didn't really like kids. So they they had to leave somehow. Right. Or maybe they, they'll say that they're actually striving upwards. They're career hopping. They're trying to become principals or superintendents or whatever, whatever, whatever else is next. Um, they'll say they'll say things like that. So like, what what do you need to have that that makes them think twice about that? You know, your motives that you actually became an instructional coach because you want to help teachers get better at teaching and you're not there to 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 evaluate them you're not there to like you're there to critique their teaching in a sense but you're not there to like put them on blast to tell on them you know to tattletale to the principal about their skills or to to spread the information about their teaching to the rest of staff you know oh, look at this teacher yeah they're really struggling look at this teacher they're really great they, you know they don't want someone who's comparing and, and making judgments like that they want someone who's objective and who looks at teaching a lot more like a science, I think, uh, who breaks down teaching into smaller steps and focuses on those individual steps as opposed to maybe getting too zoomed out and looking at there's good teachers and there's bad teachers and there's people that care and there's people that don't care. So I don't know. I come into school every day. Uh, I walk across the I walk across the parking lot and I just I give kind of you know, I give myself like a, a mental pep talk, like I'm going to go in here and I'm going to smile and I'm going to enjoy every moment of this. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to make those little conversations in the hallways with all these different teachers. I'm going to be, I'm going to make those really productive. And I find it to be really successful. I just, I guess I just don't emphasize this part of the, my, my instructional coaching as much as the knowledge and the cognitive science. Cause I think really that's the area a lot of coaches in my experience don't really know much about. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it comes almost from how long, like, okay, in America, you've got this history of instructional coaching. So it's almost a preconceived thing that someone there. So actually, what you really need to focus on is make sure you've got the knowledge. Whereas almost over here in the UK and England in particular, where we used to have judgments where you would come in twice, three times a year. People with clipboards, so judge you as a good, outstanding, or requires improvement lesson. They give you a few targets. They come back in three months' time um, and go through that. And it's not that personal relationship to actually support that. It's not reciprocal. And so there is still in lots of schools that reluctance from teachers. However well-informed and good intention the coaches are, those being coached, they're still reluctant to that support and they find any conversation is a judgment. And I know I've had to break down a lot of those barriers and just with some of the teachers I've gone in and worked with recently because that was this culture that they were in in that school. And I know there's quite a lot of books out now about building culture and teams and with instructional coaching and as you said the whole movement of even the teach talk radio and research ed and with the ect program i think those barriers are slowly breaking and i think that also comes massively that over there across the pond you have instructional coaches so it may be a slightly different barrier over there and you've got to make sure actually your coaches have that cognitive science background in terms of it what I'd be really interested in um, discussing, really, is that what is that coaching cycle? I know you mentioned it before where you would have seeing other teachers, you're modeling, um, you may be doing some planning with it. But what would you say is an effective coaching cycle with someone? Um, and also, how do you know which teachers do you work with as well? Do you go, is there a timetable where you work with them all or is there a a and all of that element. So it'd be really interesting to see the more the mechanisms of what you do as a coach. Yeah, well, I mean, there's kind of three parts to a to a coaching cycle that most people are familiar with. There's sort of like a pre kind of coaching uh, part of it, maybe like meeting with the teacher, sort of identifying strengths, uh, just discussing. That's where, like, to your point of breaking down barriers, that's where I find a lot of success, right? I sit with them and I just... 
I just kind of have a laugh sometimes at some of the, you know, the, the hardships that they go through, hardships I've had, right? I know the students in this building. Like when they when they mention certain, you know, certain students, we can we have a laugh because it's 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 funny how how hard they make our lives sometimes, right? And so you're sitting there and you're you're chatting up and and then you know you start to make a plan about you know what this teacher uh, wants or what I have to bring to the table. And we'll get to the dogmas at the you know, the next portion, but I think I've been more emphasizing what I bring to the to this discussion more than uh, their own personal goals and growth recently, and I found that to be more effective. But but basically, it's it's a period of sort of let's set up this coaching cycle so that uh, you are well aware of what, you know you have you have the right expectations for what this is going to be about, and um, we can make a plan. Let's put it into the timetable. Let's put it in the calendar. Um, I don't work with too many teachers at once. I mean, there are uh, 40, 50 teachers here. I, I don't know. Uh, I I stick to four or five teachers at a time in uh, our district has set up a six, six week cycle, um, but it's really flexible. Like if I wanted to work with one teacher for the entire year and just do multiple so-called coaching cycles, I could. Uh, if I wanted to sort of skip around, let's say you get to an expert teacher and you're sitting in that class and, and you're just watching amazing teaching and, and, and you, make, you, you make some adjustments with them and, and you have some discuss, discussions, but really it's just like, is my work really, uh, is my time and my salary and all that, is it, is it really being used the most efficiently or can I move to someone who needs a, you know, who needs a little bit more uh, support? I'll do that. Um, but I, I keep it limited. And then really the, that middle part of the coaching cycle is being in classrooms. I see so much uh, hesitation or almost fear amongst instructional coaches that I talk to about actually getting in there, actually getting you know boots on the ground inside classrooms as much as possible. And even for me, I've had, there's been, there have been times where behavior is sort of flared up in the building. There's just been testing or, you know, there's field trips, there's, there's just things that are interrupting the schedule and you start to make excuses almost of not getting into the classroom. But sometimes just being in the classroom is a little bit, it's a little tedious. It can get a little boring sometimes. You've seen so many lessons in a row, but I, I really do emphasize getting into the classrooms and then using just a few moves uh, that, that most people would recognize. I slide in during, during their teaching and I sort of uh, you know, add some coaching, some co-teaching. If they, you know, I give them a preview beforehand of what I might say. Or we're working on something like maybe creating small groups in the back table uh, through formative assessment. So beforehand, we talked about uh, we're going to be using many whiteboards to uh, assess students' uh, knowledge on this particular topic. So once you know that the student can, can do that thing, uh, you know, once you've identified students who cannot do that thing, uh, you're going to be moving students back to that back table. I'm going to be circulating in the, you know, for the rest of the students so that you can really focus on your small group instruction. And then let's see if we can fade me out and you can get this as a routine. I mean, I just did that the other day. Um, and then, you know, finally, I guess the, the last part of a traditional coaching cycle is just reflection or, uh, you know, next steps, maybe looking at maybe creating new goals. Uh, so all of that, all of that really depends on the teachers having planning, having time to meet with you, and wanting to meet with you if it's optional to, you know, to, to work with a coach. That's a very similar approach almost to the ECT program where you have that planning, um, working in the classroom, and that time for reflection. And I think that's often a oversight that you don't plan in that proper time to sit down talk to the teacher and reflect and i think one of the questions i wrote down or listening to you there is how do you get teachers upskilled with that knowledge of cognitive science almost as well um and that almost reading and research you've done how do you discern that into something that is tangible for teachers for them to take um kind of absorb that information and then put into practice within the classroom yeah it's 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 really tough um 
you know, there, there, there's the mental model of the learner that, you know, the, the kind of the true more, you know, it's not the non-controversial part of working memory is limited and long-term memory is unlimited and so on and so on that there's the opposite of that too. There's the other side where teachers sort of, I think, have maybe a naive interpretation of what, you know, how a learner learns. Maybe they think of the brain as like a muscle and, you know, the more you throw at it, you know, it will, uh, it will sort of exercise and become stronger. The more you throw at it, things will just sort of stick. And they don't see, they don't see the cognitive architecture in the way that, that they should, that would allow them to make predictions, that would allow them to explain why something is going wrong, that would allow them to sort of make plans in the future that would be more likely to work. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard, but to your question, how do I sort of get teachers to learn these cognitive science principles? Um, we have whole school PD uh, that I lead. Uh, that way, you know, I can kind of get everybody to hear the same thing all at once. And then when I'm working in the coaching cycles, I refer back to that PD. Remember when we did this, remember we talked about this, this is how it applies specifically to something you just did. Um, I have a whiteboard in my, in my office. So I'll, oftentimes we meet in my office or I'll use their whiteboard in their classroom. And sometimes I'll just draw out what I'm talking about uh, and, 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 and discuss kind of like, do you see how what we just saw, it relates totally to this, to this model that we're developing. Uh, and, and this is why, this is why it failed. You suspected it failed and, you know, and we've agreed it has, this is why. Um, I run book clubs. We read book, we read books together. I have, um, research articles I send out, you know, there's no real way of checking if they read them, but I, I send out research and I put them in people's, people's pigeonholes and, and, uh, I, but, but, but really it's, I think it's that cycle of taking whole school PD or small group PD and bringing it back into the coaching cycle, referring back to it, uh, often and always. <laughs> Yeah, and that whole school PD is an interesting one because one of the conversations that I often get lots with coaches is this concept of when you work with the individual teacher, should it be a, a target that's individual for them in their classroom or should it be a whole school, something on the school development plan or could it be a combination of both? And I think what you're almost alluding to a little bit is that there could be there is space for that whole school uh, element as well of professional development where all notice a theme across your classes that actually retrieval practice so what could this look like here's the cognitive science and i'll come in and coach in terms of that what are your thoughts in regard to that well i have many thoughts on that um and, and also, like, to add to what you said, like, also another thing we hear is that whole school PD maybe just doesn't work that well, uh, it, that, that it's, it's so abstract or divorced from the reality of the classroom that it's very hard for any of it to get into the classroom. Um, I, you know, and there's probably reading, reading, reading some research on that. That's, that's, prob that's probably the case on average. I, myself, I always took the took the mindset that when I'm in this PD, I'm going to get something out of this. Like I don't care, <laughs> I don't care if this is the worst PD ever. I'm going to I'm going to either take away something I can do, or I'm going to take away something that I'm never I'm never going to do as a result of this PD. But um, I, it, it, I, I'll be the first to say and apologize to all of these PDs that my PE teachers, maybe my art teachers, maybe my orchestra or music teachers have had to sit through that had very, very little to do with their context. On the other hand, uh, beyond the sort of domain specific or subject specific training, uh, there's some, there are some things that all classrooms have in common. I think it was Adam Boxer who recently tweeted, he's like, you can talk about domain specific PD, you know, and subject expertise and all of that forever. But you can go into, you know, he, he was saying he goes into so many classrooms and half the kids aren't listening. <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 that's half, of, half of what I do, I feel like, at least in this context, is make sure that the kids are paying attention, that they have some sort of um, uh, buy-in into the lesson, that they are, they, that, that you can see sort of behaviorally at least, that they are uh, 
uh, writing things down, that they are raising their hands, that they are not cutting off the teacher, that they're not taking over the classroom, taking the control and the authority away from the teacher. So there are things that it's a little bit of both. Uh, there, are, there are techniques and there are strategies that apply everywhere. And we have a sort of basic level that every classroom I think should meet, which is that kids are, are, are paying attention, listening in the classroom, and uh, that works for everybody. Uh, but, you know, I do have, I do feel for those, I do feel for those subject teachers who feel like the, most of the PD doesn't really apply to their classrooms too. Yeah, and I'm really glad you said about those basic elements. I read something the other day that if you imagine you wasted five minutes of every lesson, that's 20 minutes a day, that's 100 minutes a week. Imagine what that's like over a course of an academic year. That's a lot of time wasted. And if you don't have those high expectations and you don't have that element where behaviour and listening and the basic needs are there, it's very hard to build and do that. And I think then it is, especially lead nicely into my next question about uh, novices almost, that's almost what you need to support them with. They may be working in a school with high levels of deprivation and disadvantaged children, and they may, may need to look on their routines and what does that look like as well. And I think there is an idea that everyone, to a degree, needs coaching. It may look different, but they all do. And the other point you made, which is about professional development, is the report that came out with the EEF. And I know, I think it's Sam Sims wrote a few years ago. Carrie instru- Wood, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wrote that instructional coaching was one of the best um, pieces of research informed. And then he kind of, I met him and we were talking about it. And he said about this research it came out was actually you need to be mechanism rich. So any professional development, whatever format it goes through needs to make sure you build knowledge you motivate staff you develop those teaching techniques and you embed that into practice and sometimes that will work whole school sometimes though the best way is to do that within instructional coaching so if you take this idea of instructional coaching and you only ever do the um, in the classroom element well actually only developing teaching techniques you're not really building that knowledge of that cognitive science not really embedding it because you're not reflecting on that process so however good um what pd you do is or whether it is instructional coaching if you don't include enough of these mechanisms you're not making as much impact as possible with it as well so, yeah i love that and the, the paper you just referenced uh is the one i alluded to exactly uh it- and I think that gives that allows uh, us to not sort of judge like there's a, other forms of professional learning like uh, like lesson study for example or there's whole school PD or this instructional coaching it doesn't make us sort of judge these against each other it makes us look at what are the ingredients in each of these things and if you have all the right ingredients sort of it doesn't really matter what the format is uh, it, 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 it it will drive professional learning uh, it's much more likely at least. Excellent. One of the questions I'm interested in, um, and particularly alluding to when I talked about ECTs, that at the moment it's a very comprehensive uh, program that we've got over here. But how would you approach coaching a novice teacher compared to someone who's quite an expert teacher and maybe in the game for quite a long time? What sh- how would your approach differ or would it differ at all? I think it totally differs. Um, the, you know, in my experience working with new teachers is that they are, I mean, they're game for anything. They're gung ho, they're excited, they're, they're motivated. Um, but also, uh, you know, maybe this gets the idea of uh, being performance oriented or being learning oriented. They really do want to perform for this school. Uh, they want to show that the, it was worth them being hired. They want to show that, you know, they're not, the worst teacher in the world that they learned something during their their training and their student teaching um so they're they they they're, they really want to impress just like i did in my first story i they, they really want to impress people around them uh but they just don't have the they just don't have the experience in the classroom they don't have the knowledge and their their teaching programs 
I hear the same over there. I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, their teaching programs uh, often don't give them very, very useful things uh, and tools to use when they get into the classroom. They may even have, um, you know, what I would, what I would sort of, what I would consider, uh, and this is what my podcast is about. So it's just sort of that kind of romantic, maybe sort of constructivist view of teaching with the learner sort of should be self-directed, that they should discover things on their own, that, you know, teacher talk is, 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 uh, is going to stop them from learning, that teachers shouldn't have the authority, that projects are really uh, important and group work is really important. And if you are a school that where all those things I just said are things your school is encouraging, then fine, right? But uh, this gets the, you know, buildings and culture and the particular building I'm in, we're, we're more focused on ensuring students are in seats, <laughs> that they are not in the hallways or vaping in the bathrooms, that they are uh, attending to the teacher's lessons, that they are moving through the curriculum at a, at a, at a brisk pace. So they come to us with all these pre preconceived ideas, with lots and lots of motivation and enthusiasm for teaching, but also they're very, very easy to be embarrassed and very easy to be, um, to feel, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of feel, what's the word I'm looking for? Like that imposter syndrome, right? They feel like imposters. They feel like they've just been hired, but they really, sometimes they don't want to be exposed to someone who cannot teach. Um, and so you put all of that together and you, you can, you just have a lot of fun in my job. Uh, you, you work with these teachers to say, hey, you can trust me. Uh, I've been doing this for, for a bit. I taught for a, lo a lot longer than I've even been doing this. And these are the things that like got me started. These are the things that made like my life easier, that made the job more efficient. These, you know, and, and, and so when we get to some of these topics that I just mentioned, like group work, I might say, you know, you know I saw that group work <laughs> kind of falling apart. You know what I would do? And they'd say, what? And I would, and I would say, I would delay that group work for another day and just get the basics down. Let's get all the kids turning towards you so that when you explain, uh, they hear it, <laughs> right? And then you get these big sighs of relief. Oh my goodness, I was trying to move mountains as a new teacher and uh, you've given me the right to be practical and you've given me sort of the, the permission to break down this, this, this into to, to more concrete terms, more granular, uh, and, and you're going to work with me and you're here to support me. That's how I work with new teachers. Uh, should I go into expert teachers? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and I think going back to new teachers, going back um, and my experience of coaching ECTs this year, it, it's really that clarity of thought that when we go in, we don't have any preconceived ideas. It's not our class. We're not at the front of the class almost performing, which is kind of what teaching in some ways a few years ago seemed like you are performing and we've had to explore through COVID different ways of explaining and modeling ourselves and and this element actually I think it allowing teachers to say okay well let's step back and go back to those basics what are we trying to do here and that why I think just someone else to bounce those ideas off I know you work with children all day as teachers but it can often seem lonely um, if you are in a single form entry school, if you're on a wider school, at least you have your PPA that you can talk about lessons. How would I approach this? But even then, the the days are so tight and there's so much to do and the workload. Oh, that's another story. But actually, do you have that time to talk about teaching and learning? What is the impact? And if you talk to teachers, they're not leaving the profession because they don't miss the, t the teaching and learning. It's all the other bits. And I think the idea of instructional coaching giving it even just that time to have those conversations and think yeah okay i'm going to step back make professional judgment here let's go back and let's yeah as you say stop that group work and dive in to get those basics right and i think that's probably a core cool thing to come back through with this yes let me uh, let's talk about how you would coach experts um and then we're gonna have play the news and then we will come back to the other parts of the podcast so yeah how, how would your approach with expert teachers who've been in the game a long time who are very proficient in certain ways who may be um if i use the phrase stuck in their ways how would you break down those barriers and how would you almost support them in their role <laughs> well i painted the picture of the novice teacher and i i hope anyone who is at the beginning stages uh appreciated i have a lot of empathy 
for that situation. Uh, I also have equal empathy for someone who's on the other side of this continuum. Uh, these are teachers who uh, have seen a lot of leadership come and go, right? Some of them have been through multiple building renovations. I mean, I'm sitting in a building here that is one year old, and there have been teachers who can remember the old building and, you know, the time that a, that a rat scurried through the hallway and the time that, you know, they could tell you stories of, the, of when it was crumbling and when they, re, when they renovated it and when all the water tasted weird when you were drinking from the water fountains. Um, they, they've been here for a long time and they're not going anywhere. Uh, they, their, their expectation a lot of times is that someone like me is just going to fly through and just be replaced with someone else. Uh, and the same goes with all their materials. First, we started with math expressions, and then we went to math connects, and then we went to math whatever the next thing is. Uh, and you know, we had we had we had leadership telling us to get the kids to inquire and discover, and now they're telling us to instruct directly from the front. and And when will this end? You know, <laughs> and really, if I can just shut my door and I can teach, uh, that's where my biggest impact is. It's in the interactions between me and my students and me assessing their needs and me moving them forward through really good instruction. And all of that is correct. I mean, <laughs> nothing I just said is wrong. Um, I think starting by understanding that situation, I'm 33 years old, almost 34. Uh, there are teachers who are uh, about twice my age. There are teachers who have kids who are my age. Um, and so I think really being humble and and approaching this uh, as this is not another thing, this instructional coaching thing I'm, I'm putting on you. This is not something that's that's being, uh, you know, that's replacing something you used to do or, or eliminating something good from your practice. Um, what, the, what, what this is is what we can make it together. And you see how, how different I'm already speaking in terms of like co-constructing or facilitating with sort of more expert teachers as opposed to be more directive, opposed to sort of telling the novice teacher what to do. Um, I, I, I do believe uh, that that's the case in general, that it's essentially if, if you've got a teacher who has all the pieces, you're looking to identify with them something that they've wanted to try, or maybe you're, you're looking at something that they did, haven't noticed about their teaching, but you don't bring it up uh, like you haven't noticed this before, have you, with your teaching. You're more saying like, what have you tried before and why did you use this strategy? And they'll tell you. I've, I've worked with expert teachers who will tell you, I've tried everything you've said over the past 30 years at some point in time. And I've landed on this and these are the reasons why. And we explore those together. Um, it might not say, seem like you're really building capacity uh, by having these kind of discussions, but it certainly builds trust and it, it allows kind of you, them to open up and it allows them to really feel like they've been, their job is being professionalized. So I, I probably would spend maybe three fourths of my time with new and inexperienced teachers and maybe a fourth of my time with, with, with really experienced teachers. Um, and, but, but, you know, that, that, that's how I kind of handle it differently. I will say we, we're talking about novice and expert. You can be a novice at one certain thing in your teaching while being expert at other things. It's really about the domain we're talking about. Retrieval practice didn't, at least the term didn't exist until recently. People use retrieval-like things, but a lot of people don't really understand the mechanism behind retrieval. They don't understand it like by pulling it out of long-term memory, essentially telling, you know, it's almost like a survival technique. You're saying that this matters. This is, this is gonna come back up later. This is useful to me and it sticks longer. Like, these, all of that kind of discussion is relatively new. So with an expert teacher, we can dive into things that they have not heard about, that they're relative novices about, and we can build their expertise in those discussions and, and, and in, in the coaching cycles as well. And as you say, it's that co-constructing what retrieval practice you may be doing this in the past, but actually what's the research say? What's the cognitive science say? How can we tweak it? How can we co-construct it and do that? I was nodding along and laughing when you were saying about uh, you're 33, 34 years old and you're working with these teachers with children that age. And I, I'm working similar, similar age, a little bit younger, and I've been working with heads 
and and I look up to them and but then actually we're very humble we co-construct and, and you're completely right is a new area um my area of expertise is pedagogically first use of technology and how we can use that to support our explanation of modeling or ways to support retrieval practice or how we can absolutely transform how people showcase their work and what do people practice look like so i come from it almost with that ulterior motive but it's all about teaching and learning and that coaching at the same time and we have these conversations we questions we challenge each other um, and it's a really fascinating opportunity with that i'm going to um, have a little break we're talking now we're going to go to the news and then when we come back um, we're going to talk really about we've talked about supporting teachers but i really want to see about the almost the coaches side have you and I'll, I'll, we'll come back to it afterwards but have you helped other coaches um in your area or what are some of those effective strategies that you have used in your coaching career that other coaches could pick up and really utilize and then at the end we're going to go over your dogmas of of effective coaching and some of those misconceptions and we'll do that as well so here's the news for the last week and we look forward to hearing you back in a minute this program has been brought to you by the happy confident company our clinically approved, ready-to-go well-being and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio news the debate around immigration took a turn towards education this week as the uk government announced that foreign postgraduate students on non-research courses will no longer be able to bring family members to the uk according to the bbc the university of wolverhampton has already criticized the new plan Whilst Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said the move would help bring migration down, Dr Rachel Morgan Guthrie from the university said students who came with a support network were more likely to succeed. Last year, 135,788 visas were granted to dependents of foreign students, nearly nine times more than in 2019. In the same period, 680,000 foreign students studied in the UK. There was also a division within the government as some wanted to see the ban on dependents extended to all postgraduate students, whilst others, including Education Secretary Gillian Keegan, argued that there were economic benefits both to universities themselves and the wider community. Vapes have regularly appeared as a topic of concern for many teachers, and a recent report into substances found in illegal vapes is likely to raise further issues. The BBC reports that vapes confiscated from school pupils contained high levels of lead, nickel and chromium. The results of the test showed that children using them could be inhaling twice the safe limit of lead and nine times the safe amount of nickel. High levels of lead exposure can affect the central nervous system and brain development. The majority of the vapes analysed were deemed illegal and had not been tested before being sold in the UK. So-called highlighter vapes, designed in bright colours to look like highlighter pens, contained unsafe levels of the metals coming from the e-liquid. The government has allocated £3 million to tackle the sale of illegal vapes, but critics say it is not enough to deal with concerns around the number of children gaining access to these products. In Scotland, school meal debt could be scrapped in some additional areas, after North Ayrshire Council agreed an action to investigate the impact the debt was having on families and schools. Head teachers of local schools are regularly reminding parents they owe money, according to the story in the Daily Record. Twelve councils across Scotland have already abolished this type of debt. The increase in families struggling with paying for meals has been attributed to the cost of living crisis. Many schools have reported parents struggling to feed children and resorting to sending pupils to school with inadequate packed lunches or, in extreme circumstances, keeping children off school to avoid accruing more debt. Finally, and staying with the topic of food, STV reports that in Glasgow, 
Free school meals have been so popular that head teachers have had to stagger lunch times to ensure everyone can eat comfortably. The increased uptake of children in P1 to P5 accessing a free meal has again been attributed to the cost of living crisis, meaning more families are needing to access certain benefits. But at least everyone is getting a good meal and the staggered breaks have helped kitchens and dining halls to cope. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm considering how easy it is to get distracted when researching on the internet. I'm putting myself in the shoes of a young person and I've set myself a task of writing a report on the greatest invention of all time. I'm also not going to use ChatGPT. So, my first online search shows a lot of people claim the wheel is the greatest invention. And let's face it, there are a lot of them around. There are 9 million bicycles in Beijing, and that's a fact. That's 18 million wheels just on bikes in one city, if we assume nobody has a tricycle. This led me to want to know how many bicycles there are in the world. The answer I found was an estimated 1 billion. That's 2 billion wheels, again assuming nobody has a tricycle. Now I want to know how many wheels are there in the world. Another search tells me there's an estimated 37 billion, 24 of these billion being toys, and the next biggest share of 8.4 billion being on cars. A quick scan of the results page poses an additional question I hadn't considered. Are there more doors or wheels in the world? Well, I simply have to know. In a few clicks, I find out it's estimated there are 48 billion doors in the world. So based on this research, there are more doors and isn't a door a great invention? Yet it's not been proposed as one in my prior searches. And if there are that many doors, how many hinges must there be? The amazing thing about the internet is that there's always an answer. And the way search engines deliver those answers are designed to keep you interested and active. So potentially you see more ads and make them more money, which doesn't help get that report written, does it? Does your school teach young people how to research effectively? Do our young people realise how much they are advertised at? I'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, when I get in touch at TC Radio Official, I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello and welcome back to the conversation we're having with Sat Groeschel, uh, who is an instructional base uh, coach based in Seattle. Now, so far we've talked about, do you need to be an expert to be a coach? What's the coaching cycle look like? And that idea of trust as well. Now, before we move on to um, part two of tonight's conversation, I really want to explore this idea of how can we help coaches level up their game? I know in the UK, um, in England, specifically, actually, coaching will may fall to the assistant or deputy head, who's the teacher and learning lead. But actually, Zach, what would your tips be then for coaches and coaches you may have worked with, leveling up their game and making sure they are providing the best service um, possible to the teachers? Right. Well, I mean, one thing that we do here is we we have like a PLC, like a professional learning community between uh, instructional coaches. That just basically means there's a bunch of middle schools around here that have uh, instructional coaches at each building. And we meet periodically to sort of go over, uh, you know, to, to, to go over our jobs, to, to discuss how our cycles are going. Uh, a lot of times in these meetings, uh, they're not nearly as productive as, as you might think. I often tweet about just really how a lot of instructional coaches PD is really around, I, I feel, complaining a lot of times about teachers or about stressing over, you know, my role is so ill-defined or I don't have enough support for my principal or, uh, you know, teachers don't ever want to talk to me. And, and, it, and these are all like real concerns, uh, but, uh, often enough, we, we don't talk about how to teach and how to coach. Um, and so really uh, what we do here is we use these, these PLCs, these meetings between coaches to, um, you know, I, I, when I, when I host right here at this school, I will have an agenda basically that has uh, exactly what we're going to do today. And part of that will be going into classrooms with teachers having some sort of forewarning that there will be like a small group of coaches coming into your room with, you know, with badges on. Um, and we're going to be looking for things. And we're also going to be kind of exploring Zach's mind 
who is the instructional coach at this building, we're exploring sort of his process through how he deals with, with, with different instructional problems, with different situations. And a lot of times in those discussions, we bring up what we sort of just discussed around novices and experts and teachers at different stages of their journey. I'll say, so, you know, this teacher, Mr. Smith, uh, he's brand new to the school. He started with having a lot of uh, issues with behavior management. Uh, Here's some of the things I did. Uh, for example, outside of uh, his room, I had them all line up in a single file line and he stood at the door and then he greeted each of the students and would only let one in at a time and they had to go get their materials and the materials were directly in front, uh, you know, right, right, right as they passed it when they got into through the door frame. And that broke down a few times, and so I had to model it. And I think we've gotten to a point where now it's automatic with Mr. Smith. I'd love for you to look at his entry routine, and I'd like to see if he gets that strong start to the lesson right after the do now is over, and see if the structure, you know, what, you know, what would you, what would you add to the structure? And we go and we watch it, and we come back and we discuss. And and sometimes you get a lot of talk about beliefs. Maybe they. You know, you know, maybe they don't really believe in do nows or they don't really like that structured approach or, you know, can't can't students just find their own way to their seats and have a bit of a chat at the beginning of the lessons. And so we did, we may discuss philosophical things, but it's mostly the practical sort of the technique uh, around uh, a classroom and what I did. And I think I passed that on to them so they can maybe try that out with, you know, with their teachers. Um, I think we need to really refocus our training uh, of instructional coaches around how to teach. Um, I, I, a lot of my meetings with teacher, with, with instructional coaches, uh, I'm not extremely confident in, in, in my discussion with them that they really mastered teaching themselves. Uh, I'm not really confident that they could actually describe teaching to someone else in a way that was, you know, uh, I'm not trying to be me, but like not even really remotely sophisticated. And so it, it sometimes maybe too much of our emphasis around this leadership stuff, around the relationships piece, uh, winds up leading to coaches who are put into that role too early, who don't have enough expertise in teaching. And then the PD just reinforces that where it's, you know, we're going to talk more about kind of the problems with this job rather than the problems in the classroom that you're tasked of helping other people solve. <laughs> this program has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go, well-being and mental health program will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. So um, where were we? I, I know we talked about coaching and leveling up the game. So should we go? Do you want to go from that bit again? Yeah. Well, what I what I was saying just very briefly was that uh, you know it, it's important I think as coaches that we focus in on uh, learning about teaching. I think we should be obsessed with learning about teaching, and that involves uh, cognitive science principles. That involves really getting into classrooms with each other through like maybe professional learning communities. Uh, it, I think it, it means sort of avoiding some of the pitfalls uh, that, that I have seen, which is mainly around complaining about teachers, about, you know, wishing that your, your leadership were more supportive um, or, you know, hoping that, you know, things will change for you. And I think it's really about uh, it, 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 I think working together, if you have a community of other instructional coaches to, to read, you know, similar readings, to get into each other's classrooms and to discuss teaching like it's your obsession, I think that's, that's, that's what I was talking about before we broke up. Excellent. And I think, so what I want, really want to go into, and um, we talked about the cycle earlier about the planning being in the classroom. Um, what I really want to talk about is actually what are some of those effective strategies you've given for feedback almost in that third cycle? Because if anything, that's this element for my observations is the one that's overlooked or it's rushed um, and done very quickly at the end to the coaches like running between things or if they're an assistant head, there's a parent come in or there's a behavior issue or something else they've got to deal with. Um, and I think it's a really core and we go back to what we said about earlier about the EEF it's about um 
building the knowledge, but also the embedding of the practice. I think that feedback section is really important. What are some of those things that you've done that have made it purposeful and impactful? Right. Well, I mean, I start with the premise when I'm giving feedback that adults do want to receive feedback, that they are, they, they do appreciate it. And I think a lot of times in coaching, we fall into the trap of thinking that adults do not want feedback. And, and, you know, there's, there's some, there's some funny research around, uh, you know, people, people really wishing certain things, you know, people would give them feedback if the opportunity arises, like if there's something stuck in your teeth or, you know, there's a dot on your face or something, you know, that people appreciate when you mention things to them that they can't otherwise see themselves. Uh, but there's also a reality when working with anyone, but maybe especially adults, uh, that, you know, they've sort of reached this, this, this in their lives where, uh, they, they don't, they don't want to feel coerced. They don't want to feel like, uh, that you think less of them. I mean, we, a lot of us end up, you know, go, going out to, to function after school together to the pub or whatever. Uh, they don't, they don't want to feel like someone's lurking on them who's 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 criticizing their every move who's you know trying to to, trying to control their teaching and who's tattling on them who's telling telling uh, about their teaching to other people so all of this is wrapped up in 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 how you give feedback um you have to make the time should be very obvious to give the feedback you mentioned there's a kid that pops in here and there there's a staff meeting here we have a sub shortage you know cover teacher shortage where a lot of times the teachers are uh teaching each other's classes subbing uh you know covering each other's classes and these feedback meetings get put off well beyond what we could expect would would be when they're effective um but making the time carving it out doing whatever you can to get with them and talk with them and if you can't at least give them that email uh you know and, and and prepare for the next time but what i what i do is i like to I really, you do have to start with what you saw in the lesson. Um, A lot of coaches will start by saying, how did, you know, how did you think it went? And that might open up something that will allow you to to, to then uh, have a feedback sort of discussion. Other, you know, I I tend not to use that one as much, but I, I like to go and zoom in on one part of the lesson. So I'll like describe it like a narrative. I'll say, uh, so remember the time between when you discussed the learning intention, right, or the learning target of the lesson. You said, like, this is what we're going to be working on. And then at, at, after that, what happened? And the teacher will almost nine times out of ten start discussing things that they, that they wish they had done differently. And that's sort of almost sort of embedded feedback right there because they're just sort of admitting or, or, or discussing areas and giving themselves tips for what they would do better. And that's where we, that's where we have a chat. We have a laugh. We discuss that one part. And, and then I will, I will then usually offer up, uh, some sort of, you know, uh, this is what you should do next. And here's why type of feedback where I'll say, so one thing I've done in that situation is this. And I might stand up. I'm in my office right now or in their classrooms. I'll stand up and I'll say, so like, I, instead of having uh, the students uh, all start the task and then you run off and, and start circulating really quickly, uh, uh, there's this guy named Adam Boxer who's taught me about the 3-30-30 rule, which is basically where I'm going to stand in one spot at the front of the room and I'm going to look around, see me looking, you know, move my neck, crane it back and forth. And I'm going to wait until uh, the students are uh, actually doing the task. And anytime there's a hand up, I'm going to have them put their hand down by doing a little uh, gesture with my hand to say, put your hand down and, you know, get yourself unstuck. And then we'll have a discussion around, like, what are the what are the trade offs there? Uh, What are the you know, what could go right? What could go wrong? And, uh, you know, at that point, I've given them not only a bit of feedback, that that may have been self-generated i've given them my own feedback without really critiquing them and i've given them something to do a tool to use tomorrow i always have to then wrap up this situation with uh with this part of the discussion with i'd love to see you try it out i know that maybe like me 
trying it out in the next lesson might be too early or is it not too early? Yeah, it might be too early. Do you wanna go kind of work on that, practice that? I'd love to see you do it. Uh, and, and most of the time at that point, they're like, great. Uh, yeah, I'll see you next lesson. Sometimes in situations, we'll ask if I can model that particular technique in which I'll say, great. Uh, for the 333 technique, all I need you to do is you're going to teach right up to that point, and then I'm going to take over, and I'm going to stand in this spot, and I will show you kind of how I get kids to put their hands down and how to focus in on the task that's in front of them. Uh, let's do it next lesson. It's coming right up. I, you know, I saw this most recent one. It's totally applicable. You're just repeating it because it's a middle school. Uh, let's try it again. Um, I... That sounds all messy and stuff, but at least in my mind, that makes sense. I mean, do you have any questions <laughs> about that? No, I I was nodding along to that because that whole process of feedback um, very much. I know Josh Goodrich has like a simple view of coaching and then he's got a more complex one there. He shared at a national research ad last year and it's kind of really built into that ECT and zooming in, and I often use the phrase instead of, as you said, how do you think it went? I think that's actually too open-ended. I think zooming in is really important, and I often say, I noticed you um, gave an instruction while the children are on the floor. Um, what was the impact of that? Or I, I noticed you asked pupils to think, pair, share, use the technique, think, pair, share at this point. Um what was the feedback, what you expected or something else? And I'll get them to really be specific and because I'm, I'm trying to get them to go on a journey as well. And I think doing almost, as you say, team teaching or go and trial it a few times, I'll come back and see it. And it depends on what you want to do. And I wrote down and I circled it here. Because you referred to Adam Boxer and I know we talked about Tom Shellington at the beginning and I know um, – the tool tips for teachers. I'm just like a pie big, so I've just got a whole bookshelf of education books. Um, and my <laughs> wife it, it, it. was like, I need to get rid of books and books. And I was like, no, no I'm keeping them over there because I need them. And I, in some ways, I wish I could carry them all around with me. Um, and I, I'm a mix between Kindle and physical, depending on what I've, what kind of book it is. But um, the tips for teachers and loads of these other books, they codify it. They make something in teaching that's tangible. So I find those tools are really helpful for me as a coach to go in, okay, this is what I noticed. This is um, this is some research behind it. Try this technique. Let's, let's adapt it. Let's make it work for you as a teacher, but also for your class, for your setting and all of that. And I think almost being that guide to really be specific um, about that certain element is really important and uh, echoes what I've seen and what I've tried to replicate as well so i think that's that's a really important element um i kind of want to move on to this next element i know in preparation for the show i asked you um about instructional coaching and a few bits and pieces and we want to talk about what are some of those common misconceptions or myths about instructional coaching and how educators can overcome them and you sent me a series of about 10 different points in there things like teachers should always choose the topic of their coaching or teachers can choose to engage in coaching or not and a few things in there as well so i've got those in front of me and i may just pick out two or three and it'd be great for you to expand and just share your thoughts on those if that's okay yeah perfect and you know and i'll i'll add in like these aren't necessarily myths like you know a myth is like sasquatch right like it's something yeah. that that, that no one has ever seen, but it's widely believed that it exists. Um, I, I, I call these dogmas because I think they're just more conventional beliefs sort of handed down from the beginnings of instructional coaching that I think they're questionable. I think especially if we talk about different buildings and different cultures, different types of uh, 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 schools that they don't always hold up depending on those schools. So yeah, let's dive right in. Okay, so um, the one I really want to pick up first is teachers can choose to engage in coaching or not. That's a really <laughs> interesting one you've put there. I know it's quite a meaty, challenging one to start off with, um, but I think it's it's fascinating. And what I'm trying to do with my shows at the moment is get teachers to think and leaders to think ready for setting up September 
in some ways and that future planning and getting that ethos right and that climate right in their school so teachers can choose to engage in coaching or not can you expand on that idea for me Zach? <laughs> right well this is the one you picked out one that i think probably the fewest people agree with me um i think most i think most people believe that uh, instructional coaching should be optional, opt-in, right? It's one in which uh, teachers uh, choose if they, you know, if that's really, you know, part of their schedule, part, you know, if that will fit into their, their plans. And it, the idea, I think, behind it is that that will give them sort of a lot of more, you know, buy-in, sort of intrinsic motivation, I suppose, to engage in coaching. And I think if you're at a building in which um, there's lots of PD opportunities or sort of pick your own adventure and, and, and maybe they're inundated with uh, professional development of other sorts, uh, perhaps that, that, that's just fine. You know, you can expect to learn in, in other places. Um, I just don't, I, I have a lot of problems with that idea. Uh, the first has to do with what I think the ethos, as you mentioned, the ethos of my school should be. Um, I think that this, whatever school I want to work at is a school in which we say everybody here engages in instructional coaching. It's not one that uh, the, uh, you know, some teachers who maybe have been around the block can say, I'm, I'm over instructional coaching. I've, 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 I've become such a great teacher that I don't have anything to learn. It's also not a place where we know from like the Dunning-Kruger effect, right, that, that sometimes people that have the least amount of knowledge think they have the most, right? So that people that really, they think, they think they've got it all together. And truthfully, they're actually the very people that need instructional coaching the most. Um, I just also just don't think, it just doesn't make any sense to me because we have in, in, in this school and in every school I've worked at, we have mandatory PD. And some of it is, you know, blood pathogens and first aid and, 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 you know, things about around safety uh, that everyone has to do because of the, you know, maybe some sort of government mandate. But other things are, you know, whole school PD around, uh, you know, around how to form, formulate discussions, how to create explanations, how to do questioning, basic teaching things are mandated from above. And it just doesn't make any sense to me that you're forced to go and sit in this room for those things. And then yet we're paying a lot more money. I mean, a six figure salary for most of these instructional coaches, as opposed to what some of these PDs are just free. Uh, we're paying a lot more money and putting a huge amount of investment in instructional coaching and you get to opt out of this. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't really, it's not really the, the ethos of the school I want to be in where I, I say, I will hire you and you get to choose whether or not you think you're, you're ready or not for instructional coaching. I want to work at a school where we say everybody here engages in instructional coaching as part of their professional responsibilities. I'm really ready for you to say that I'm wrong on this. Uh, it will not offend me. <laughs> no. And I've, I've been in a privileged place within the last, uh, this academic year where we've I've worked with someone going over a school and we've really taken up the what what is that culture of the school and it takes time and we have been right this is part of our offer almost this is part of our professional development this is what it should look like and I completely agree that it should be it instructional coaching should be part of the offer but it should be done right and I think where it hasn't been or where teachers may disagree with you and i completely see why people would um it's because it's very interpersonal it's completely different to what people have been used to before and i think that is probably the crux of why people disagree with it in some ways and over here do we think it should be part of it i don't know we don't have instructional coaches should it be part of a almost the job description and i think that's the next stage for us in england is actually looking at making sure this is embedded part of our culture it should be a way to support teachers and if we're moving away from judgments of lessons this is the next natural step but with anything there can be poor implementation there'll be great implementation of things and you said earlier about assessing um you've got different groups where you've got that 
actually there are, I know John Hutchinson with the Reach Academy and a few others, and with Ambition, they've started setting up coaching areas and bits and pieces. So the, there is a massive momentum over here, and I think we're almost on the wave of exploring it. I think, so I completely agree with you in that. I think we need to invest. Everyone needs to go through it. And also it offers slightly more clarity that actually this is our approach, this is our approach of professional development. In our school over the last year, we had a um, th- almost whole school theme about professional development. We did something called class and our coaching was linked to it. It might not be completely specific, but it linked to that overall um, need. And actually that worked and had a massive impact in trying to build that in going forward as well. So let's have a um, a look at another point you made. I think this is an interesting one, which is coaches can be weaker teachers than their mentees. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, I think like regardless of your system or my system or whatever instructional coaching role you you know you've designated, there's going to be there's not going to be enough of the best teachers in the world to fill this this position. And actually it would be a tragedy for education if everyone who was great at teaching, <laughs> uh, you know, made themselves into full, full-time instructional coaches and left the classroom. But um, there, I think there's an element of truth in, in, in this, in, in, in the idea that the instructional coach needs to be a very, very skilled uh, teacher who has had success with multiple uh maybe subjects or maybe age groups who has uh, maybe not just worked in just one school, but it's worked in a few different organizations in which they can sort of compare. Um, a lot of my success, I think, comes from drawing on prior knowledge, maybe all of it. And uh, the, the and, 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 and thinking about what I would have done in that situation or what I have read or what I have observed if I was doing, and that doesn't just come with uh, one or two years of teaching. And it certainly doesn't, it doesn't, I, I think if you failed to be able to teach in class, it's, it, it's often going to be, you probably weren't very good at dissecting your own teaching in some ways. I have a hard time imagining you were able to dissect teaching for someone else. Um, I just, and I say all of this being uh, perhaps uh, in a situation where I've seen coaches graduate to being, I mean, teachers graduate to being instructional coaches after only two or three years in the classroom. I've known people in that building with them and, and, and knew that this person was just planning to get out the minute they started and, and they didn't see any of those fantastic practices that they're supposed to be spreading on to, you know, to other people. So uh, I absolutely think you need to have a, a high level of competence in teaching and to be able to describe teaching and have this just general uh, uh, obsession with teaching as a science, as an art, to be a good coach. Comes back to that, my point that I often make is not all teachers can be a good leader. And I think there are different skill sets as well and that. And so do you think there is a disservice if an instructional coach is not a practicing teacher? So if they've been out of the classroom for a few years um, and they are given guidance to teachers that actually mm. they haven't done stuff in recent years, do you think there's a disconnect there? Or And if there is, how can you as an instructional coach overcome that and actually understand what the pressures are of being a classroom teacher yeah i mean well you know we discussed if you're just tuning in now we discussed earlier how the model of instructional coaching here is basically you do leave the classroom and it's it's much more likely much it happens way more frequently that these instructional coaches stay in coaching or move on to uh you know being a principal or whatever else than it is that they go back into the classroom. So th- this model that we have here really does not, sub- uh, it's, it's impossible for uh, most coaches to get on the ground experience anytime soon, right? They may sub or, you know, cover a, a class here and there. They may have to do a little bit of teaching in terms of that co-teaching or the modeling, but they're out, they're out of the class. Uh, and I've been out of the class now for, for, for several years. Um, which is why I think your model is probably better in some ways. 
uh, I wish I had one foot in the class because every time I teach a long extended lesson or period of time with students, I have a, you know, sort of my mind gets reset. I'm not in that high in the sky thought thinker anymore, which I think maybe is a characteristic of being in the university world, <laughs> being in academia and never teaching children, uh, all of a sudden uh, I become grounded in, you know why this teacher didn't seem to be making an effort in this particular scenario? It's, it's because this is a very hard job. It requires multitasking. It, require, it has a, a high cognitive load in terms of trying to hold in mind all of these different responsibilities. The the um, announcements came on in the middle unexpectedly to call some students interrupting their train of thought the student in the back is not being supported by the principal in terms of their behavior and and and, and you re all of that comes back together for you to have a way more realistic picture of how you can support teachers so i i definitely think you need to be in the classroom somehow i just in this particular model i don't really know how i don't know really how to do it other than to just uh occasionally teach lessons and occasionally uh uh you know uh take the position and the mindset you know to empathize with the teacher excellent yeah i i, th I agree with that and it is it's different and this is why i was really excited for this conversation because it is a completely different model of your role across the pond to it is over here but then there are advantages is and disadvantages with it as well and i think one common theme though is that knowledge of teacher and learning and that cognitive science has really come through the the coaching cycle very similarities between it all because it's all linked back to research and so it's now almost these mechanisms this nuances of what a coach needs to be and do in some ways that if we can get that right if we can get the culture right well, hopefully we can actually help all our teachers go through that process as well. I was talking to someone recently um, and my CEO often says, oh, what's your, what's, what's the next part of your career and everything else? And I think in teaching now, there's a whole vast array of things you can do or could do. And some people may be incredible coaches. Some people may be incredible leaders um, and they're different avenues and different options. And I think we've, got to really play to our strengths that's one reason why i went into primary school elementary because i loved a little bit of music or art or teaching english or reading and and doing sport and all of those facets and i think that's the wonderful thing in terms of it and it goes back to one of the last dogmas i want to explore before i ask you the last question about what what's that one piece of advice you give to a coach i want to go back to the one um this point that you said coaching can ignore specific subjects to focus on general teaching strategies yeah um it's, it's funny we both come from the primary background i mean that's where you know that's where i taught and uh and now but now i'm in secondary and it's uh it's a different world a little bit instructional coaching in those two realms because everybody in primary is a generalist you, you, very few people teaching primary uh, are just as expert in math as they are in science and in reading and, and whatever else. All, this, all the subjects are taught there. And so, but when you get to secondary, that's where teachers begin to, you know, that's where the, the, the courses start to specialize. The students start to see that, you know, everything is in disciplines and the, the lines between the disciplines become less blurred. And the importance of teacher expertise in that uh, discipline is, is so important. Um, I, we touched on this already, but I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I think we cannot ignore uh, the importance of subject expertise, but there is a, um, unless you're the head of department and you're doing instructional coaching for your department, um, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a quandary there. There's a bit of a problem in that I'm a generalist instructional coach working with teachers who I'm supposed to support them with their subject specific teaching, their pedagogical content knowledge, right? And so um, I think that has to be an emphasis for coaches in secondary who are in roles like mine, or uh, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're a principal doing instructional coaching, 
uh, that you, ha you have to yourself investigate uh, ways to teach that are specific to subjects. And for me, the easiest way to do that is I, I, look, at the, I look at the curriculum materials, right? I, attend, I, I observe a lot of lessons that are not part of this co these coaching cycles. I want to see what it looks like to teach a science lesson compared to what it looks like to teach a, a history lesson or whatever else. And I'm digging into blogs. Uh, you know, I have a, a large, it sounds like you're a big reader too. I, I have a, a large amount of books and also a lot of blogs on my RSS feed. Uh, I use this pl uh, platform called Feedly, where basically I plug in the blogs and they all come into this like one stream. But I'm, li I'm reading uh, from subject experts uh, that, that teach at various different age levels, trying to, try, try to at least be able to have enough accumulated knowledge in these subjects to be able to infuse into my coaching cycle some subject-specific support. It's not perfect. It would be much better, I think, if we had a model where I was just coaching my area of expertise, which as I said before, is, is there's no area of expertise because I started in primary. So <laughs> what do you think about that? I would think back to a model that I often use when I talk about technology. It's called the TPAC model. So you have the, the P, which is the pedagogy. So the pedagogy, of the general teaching almost. So your core umbrella terms of explanation, modeling, retrieval practice, pupil practice, um, forgetting curve and those kind of elements. And then you've got the content. So in art, would you model it in the same way that you may do in science or in history when you're writing like a historian? And it's actually almost that middle element, that Venn diagram, if actually what are those general approaches then that can help me teach that content in the most suitable way. So I can be a scientist or I can think like a historian or think like an artist as well. And I think I would have problem with if you only coached a certain subject, actually is your viewpoint too narrow. You need to go and have a look at what can I learn from the scientists? What can I learn from these others? Because at the end of the day, that's what our students are. They're, they're swapping between all of these different subjects day in, day out. We need to then make sure we can learn from each of the different domains. And actually, there may be something completely different in these disciplines that actually marry up really nicely. And part of the TPAT model actually adds technology on top. So I need to not only think about the pedagogy, the content of the technology, very much like tonight the technology is going off on another tangent, but it's how do you balance these? And sometimes you may need to think more content on, right, here's a science experiment. That's where the emphasis is on more, but actually I can't use, there's, there may be a generic explanation modeling. I know the core mechanisms of what makes good explanation modeling let's use those and that's going to look very different when i go to the art lesson that i'm going to coach next i know i was working with an ect um recently and she was struggling with pe tricky class a couple of tricky children in there but i was trying to show some things that i did in pe like short really clear instruction non-verbal clues uh, and things like that that hopefully will make her think a little bit about actually how would this translate back into the classroom environment because it is very different to trying to control 30 children outside than actually 30 children inside where you've got that safe space um as well and it's 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 that balance between the two but i think there is crossover but there's also you've got to work out what works when so for example if you think about music in particular i think that's quite a specialist area um breaking down bark crowds and actually going into the depth of that well you need to have some good understanding you can play it you can listen to it but actually you're going to explain it in a completely different way than you would say about shading an apple and looking at where light comes from completely different areas um, of disciplines in some ways absolutely i mean and even some of the things we've talked about in the cognitive science uh world uh, it, it, I find myself struggling to see how they apply until I finally, until I finally wrap my head around it. I mean, like a good example is worked examples. 
Uh, we, you know, we always say worked examples are important to front load at the beginning of a, uh, you know, for novices because it allows them to sort of appreciate, you know, an expert schema allows them to think about that material as, as opposed to trying to solve the material on their own through, you know, through discovery or whatever. And then, but then you have to take a step back and go, so I know what a worked example looks like in mass. <laughs> Everybody does. It's just you at the board, you know, slowly putting down each, each step of a problem. But when I'm reading a novel, uh, I'm not going to stop and work out uh, uh, what's, in, what's inside the novel. What does a worked example look like when you're reading a novel? And, you know, and, and finally, like, after, after exposing myself to enough reading and, and being in classes, you know, you can say, like, worked examples do apply in English class or in literature class. But what they look like is, uh, in the case I gave was, you know, if, if I'm talking about really tricky text, I'm going to give uh, some definitions beforehand, like some pre-teaching, and then afterwards, I'm going to give some sort of expert explanation of what we just heard, then that's the worked example. Or if you're teaching pottery or ceramics, maybe the, the teacher is putting posters around the uh, pottery studio, and the students are referring to these worked examples, step-by-step -step instructions for how to do, you know, how to work with the clay. Uh, so it... It does take, I think we cannot just say that all instructional coaching is general, uh, even though there's elements of behavior and attention that apply everywhere. Uh, we do have to focus on subjects, even though it's, it's pretty tricky if you're, you know, in my situation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, I want to end with this one question. Um, and I want you to think of it in terms of coaches. So what is that one piece of advice you give to someone who wants to start out with being a good instructional coach? Wow, that's, yeah, huge, huge question. Um, I, I have to go back to, I think, you know, what I struggled with uh, at, at first. And I, 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 think, I think the main thing is to be confident about going into classrooms and using your uh, and really being, I think being strong with your confidence of of being an expert in some things, uh, you, you have to you have to you know, have humility and you need to be conscious of other people. But honestly, at the very beginning, I was uh, a bit nervous about sharing out. I, was, I tried to take a very facilitative approach where I took a back seat and let the teachers do the talking. And what I realized through maybe being a little too extreme in that way was that I was not really changing instruction. I wasn't improving instruction and the teachers weren't doing anything different that led to student outcomes. So it's a combination of be, uh, of reading up, doing your homework, but also being confident to, to get in the classroom and to use that, use that time to give feedback. And if that means being a little bit more directive than than I imagined it or that some people imagined it, I think that that's okay. Uh, I'll add on to this, you know, we're, we're just wrapping up. I'll add uh, that uh, when you're a teacher, you know what it's like to work hard. Like your time, like I, I ended every day dehydrated, tired, my legs, you know, <laughs> my legs felt, 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 I felt exhausted. I'd go home and plop on the couch and, and want to watch TV. And during, my first few years of instructional coaching and talking to other coaches, I don't know if we, uh, if we hold ourselves to that highest standard. So I would really say, like, if you're there to coach, you, you, you've got to put in the work. You've got to get into the classrooms. You've got to help teachers. Uh, don't make this, if you're in my position of being a full-time instructional coach, don't make this just another salary that's being wasted, uh, being the stereotype we have around here of someone who's just always founded their office. You've got to be part of that program. Brilliant. Two really cool takeaways there. Being confident and also make sure you work hard and you make that salary count in some ways as well. So just to uh, wrap up in uh, just the end. So it's been a fascinating talk with Sat Groshal. Um, I say this evening, it's lunchtime around for you now, isn't it? Over there across the pond. <laughs> But in terms of impact on student outcomes, we know instructional coaching has won the strongest basis of evidence, but it is all about those mechanisms that make it a really impactful um, approach to professional development. 
So thank you for listening to Teacher Talk Radio. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Sack about instructional coaching. To listen back to Teacher Talk Radio shows, please download Podbeam app or visit your favourite podcast player and search Teacher Talk Radio. You can also visit ttradio.org forward slash listen back. Follow us on Twitter on TT Radio Official and tweet us using the hashtag TT Radio. My name has been Jay Rabburn. You can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Rabburn and Sack Rochelle at Mr. Sack G. Thank you for listening. And until next time, goodbye. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go, well being and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.